Sharia law covers all areas of life, but the details of Sharia sexual law are especially shocking, even disgusting. But we'll talk about it openly here. You need to hear this. Today we are going to take a look at what we call the uh, Orthodox Aqidah uh, of Islam or the Islamic Aqidah. And with me here, of course, in studio to unpack all of that for us, our dear brother Lloyd de Young. Lloyd, welcome back, brother, and thank you for the amazing work that uh, you do and for the work that you've done uh, with us so far in this uh, particular series. Uh, uh, please uh, walk us through this uh, so-called Aqidah. Oh, thank you. Great pleasure to be here. So, basic orthodoxy in Islam. Just like Christians have the Nicene Creed, for instance, Islam has its own creed. This is called the Aqidah, and this was formulated roughly around the 9th century. The Aqidah refers to those matters of faith which are believed in with certainty and conviction. I would have to go into the Sharia later to explain the, what they mean by certainty and conviction, because these are legal terms with very, very clear definitions, very explicit definitions in the Sharia. And they also believe in one's heart and one's soul. They are not tainted with any doubt or uncertainty. Doubt in Islam is illegal for a Muslim. It is not allowed. Now, like the Nicene Creed, it establishes orthodox beliefs and refutes deviations. It is the foundation of the faith. It consists of matters which are known from the Quran and sound a hadith, and which the Muslim must believe in his heart. Notice this is a very subtle point here. Doesn't mean he needs to say them out loud. He can lie about them as long as he believes them in his heart, in acknowledgement of the truth of Allah and his messenger. Popular statements of basic Sunni Islamic doctrine or articles of faith are the Aqidah al-Tahawiyah, for instance, the Ashari Aqidah, and the Maturidi. And Aqidah is a primary science within Islam. And so, yeah, by the way, this is a legal loophole. This here is a legal loophole. These words are very subtle when they make these little changes. Now notice here, we follow the Sunnah of the Prophet and the congregations of the Muslims, and we avoid deviation, differences, and divisions. This is very important. Let's look at number 74. We love the people of justice, and we hate people of injustice and treachery. That's you if you're not a Muslim. And notice this. Have you heard the French saying, Allah knows best? Well, it's actually part of the Islamic creed. When our knowledge about something is unclear, we say, Allah knows best. This is actually a part of the Islamic creed. It's a statement of faith in Islam. Something Muslims have to believe, something they have to internalize, and they must keep this with them in their hearts. Now, faith aside, Islam is a religion of law. Thus, we have two basic questions that follow. What are its laws? Where are they written? We need to define this. Now, let's have a look at the Pakistani court system and Islamic law. And let's look at Quran 65.4. Everyone is very familiar with Quran 65.4. This is the one, well, you know what this is. And it is the source of endless debate in circles. Let's end that debate today. On the basis of the exploratory analysis of the reported cases, the following books are found to be relied upon more frequently by the courts to derive what is an authentic point of Islamic law on a particular issue. One, the Hedayah translated by Charles Hamilton, 1791. Two, Digest of Muhammadan Law by Neil Bailey. Three, The Muhammadan Law by Said Amir Ali. And four, Principles of Muhammadan Law by Dr. Badiev Mullah. This is in a paper called The Genealogical Analysis of Islamic Law Books Relied on in the Courts of Pakistan by Professor of Law, PhD, Shahbaz Ahmed Chima, okay, as well as Samir Ozer Khan, Assistant Professor, College of Law, University of the Punjab. So these are two law professors who are telling us which fiqh books are being used in the court system today in Pakistan. Let's have a look. They've mentioned here this, this Digest of Muhammadan Law by Neil Bailey. Let's have a look at this here. So this is the book here. This goes way back. The British had this translated a long time ago. Al-Fadi, are you there at the moment? I am. Al-Fadi, can you read for me the highlighted section in yellow, please? Yes, um, it says, Fourth, when a man has had sexual intercourse, uh, intercourse with a girl under the age of nine years and has re uh, ruptured, uh, I, I cannot see really the rest of the... Uh, the, the parts. Part. Okay, uh, then the I'll parts, read it. Okay, so. uh, rupture the parts. Okay. Uh, it is unlawful of him to have further connection with her 
but she is not released from her ties if connected with him by marriage or slavery. If no rupture has taken place, the prohibition is not incurred according to the most valid opinion. So the most valid opinion is the ijma, the consensus of the scholars. Now, do you know what this means, Afadi? Well, I mean, uh, certainly it's talking about, uh, you know, child, uh, basically rape here. This is when a man has sexual intercourse with his prepubescent wife, right? If he destroys her private parts and rips her open so that from the bottom of her vagina, it rips it, the skin open to the anus, then he should not have sex with her again. However, if he does do this with his prepubescent child wife, and he does not destroy her this way medically, then he may continue to do so without issue. That is what this means. This explains, this is the Quranic law, which is derived from Quran 65.4. Let me continue. Let's have a look at the reliance of the traveler. We look at a few sources here. Quran 65.4 says, As for your women who have despaired of further menstruating, if you are in doubt, their waiting period shall be three months. And those who have not menstruated yet. Right? We all know this verse. A woman's postmarital waiting period, the idda, Rule N9.1, there is no waiting period for a woman divorced before having had sexual intercourse with her husband. Fantastic. N9.2, a waiting period is obligatory for a woman divorced after intercourse, whether the husband and wife are prepubescent, have reached puberty, or one has reached maturity and one is prepubescent and the other has not. Intercourse means copulation. So notice, a waiting period is obligatory for a woman divorced after intercourse if she is, well, yeah. Notice it says here, you can have sex with your prepubescent wife. Uh, your thoughts on this, Alfadi, before I go on? I know, I mean, it's, uh, it's uh, very troubling, uh, to be honest with you. And this is the verse that we bring to the forefront uh, to bring to the attention of our Muslim friends. And yet, they adamantly deny that it means this. Yes, yes. I will continue. When a woman has been made love to, she must repeat the ghusl. This is the ritual bathing after sex. So when a woman has been made love to, she must repeat the bathing if two conditions exist, that she is not a child, but rather old enough to have sexual gratification. So if she's not a child, she should then bathe. But if she is a child, bathing is not obligatory upon her. I hope this is clear to the audience. So it says here, when you have made love to your wife, she must repeat the bathing if she is not a child. But if she is a child, bathing is not obligatory upon her. A full indemnity is paid for injuries which paralyze these members or for injuring the peritoneal wall between the vagina and rectum so they become one aperture. So notice this is recognized in Islamic Royal Alliance 0413, Book of Justice, page 592. This rupturing of this wall between vagina and anus is a recognized issue in Islam, and you can receive compensation for this. Now, final one. This is the Fiqh to Educate Women from the Heavenly Ornaments by Hishti Zever. The Jewels of Paradise, Heavenly Ornaments, a favorite with the people of the Indian subcontinent as well as the Indian Muslim diaspora all over the world. It is a comprehensive encyclopedia, in fact, of Fiqh, Islamic rituals and morals. Five, if a person has sexual intercourse with a minor girl, Bathing will not be obligatory on her, but in order to get into the habit, she should be made to bath. Notice, if you have sexual intercourse with a minor, Fadi, uh, what does minor mean? Well, I mean, uh, minor is just someone who's under the age of uh, puberty, basically. Correct. Two, if a woman is under age, but not so small, that if one has intercourse with her, there is a fear of the vaginal tissues tearing to such an extent that the vagina and anus will virtually come together, then by the insertion of the glands of the penis into her vagina, bathing will become obligatory fad on the man if he has reached, if he has reached the age of puberty, if he has reached the age of puberty. However, if there is the aforementioned fear in a very minor goal, then the mere insertion of the penis does not render bathing obligatory. We're now seeing in another Islamic law source, the very same rulings. But notice, they make a distinction between a woman who is underage, a minor, and a very minor girl. Now, I will drop links in the chat later, perhaps in the comments, and I will, you know, so that hopefully that can be pinned. I will show you a 
fatwa on Islam QA, which discusses this, the Islamic scholars have agreed there is no minimum age for sex with a child in Islam. There is no minimum age. So even sex with infants, infant being defined as a baby in the cradle, is legal. If a person whose testicles have been cut off inserts his penis into the back part of anyone or the vagina of a woman, bathing will be obligatory on both of them if both are mature. So if you have sex with someone, bathing is obligatory if they are both mature. If they're not mature, well, it'll be obligatory on the one who is mature. So Fadi, uh, I'll find your thoughts on that. This is from Baish Dizevr. It's an encyclopedia of Islam dealing in a very simple way with the tenets and principles to practice in day-to-day -day life. I'll find your thoughts, please. There is nothing to say here, brother. I mean, it's just uh, as disgusting as it sounds, actually. And we want to apologize to our audience. Uh, that's not our intent, but we want to share with you from these sources. That's what these sources are saying. So you can see why uh, this is a very troubling issue. If it is uh, anything outside of Islam, people will be jumping all over it and saying this is child abuse. But here we go. This is what Islam and its Sharia teach. Let's see how many people will make that claim now. Right. So shall I continue or shall we end here? I would say let's end here and uh, then yeah. we yeah. will come back again. But what should people expect next time? So I will continue with some more of these laws because I want to settle the matter of Quran 65.4. I want to show how the Quranic verse and the Hadith of Aisha were then taken into doctrine and then transmitted into law and now expressed as a legal right, as permission to have sex with underage prepubescent minors. In fact, even with infants. And we will see that as well. Yeah. And just for the benefit of those who are watching right now, I did a uh, complete video series with David Wood recently on this very topic about the age of Aisha. And this, of course, is going to highlight for you uh, the fact that it is absolutely acceptable uh, to have uh, a marriage, child marriage in Islam, even not only at nine year old, but even as my brother mentioned here, even as a young, uh, basically, uh, baby, uh, if you wish, uh, one year old. So uh, I hope that everyone is going to be watching this, sharing it with others, and uh, for the purpose, of course, to wake up our Muslim friends from uh, this deep sleep that they're in, because not a whole lot of them actually will be aware of things like this, but these are their own rulings and their own uh, primary sources. Thank you, brother. Uh, this is Al Fadi, over and out. Take care, God bless. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International, and click on the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or go live. I would also like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking the link right below. By doing so, you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you where you can give to our channel. I thank you from the bottom of my heart.